Hey guys, welcome back to the Man Cave 4301 podcast. I'm your host, Big Kev. Thank you very much for tuning in. Just a quick reminder before we get into this podcast, go and see this on YouTube if you're not watching it on YouTube already. So uh, you can find it over there. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share this video uh, on whatever platform that you see fit and, and get the word out there. The more people that we can get out there and the more stories, the more relatable uh, the stories that people can listen to, the better so that uh, they can draw off these experiences and possibly help themselves out uh, with mental health, PTSD, anxiety, depression and all that sort of stuff so hit the share button subscribe uh, follow me on instagram facebook and youtube it'd be muchly appreciated i know i haven't been uh, very uh, active lately but uh, there has been a lot going on so that's for another podcast but uh, as of now let's get into this podcast Today's guest joined the military in 1996 in the Ready Reserves until a scheme was canned by the Howard government. After a short stint out of the military, he went on to join the Air Force as an aircraft life support fitter in 2001. But with the aim to do his job to its full extent, he left the Air Force and joined the Army as a craftsman, electrical engineer, where he fitted aircraft life support systems. He deployed to Timor, Qatar, Afghanistan, and is now a paramedic and has been for the past 10 years. He's also an author in his spare time. Keith McArdle, welcome to the podcast. You're very welcome, right? Thanks for having me. So usually we start off with, um, why did you join the military? Well, I basically joined the military um, for a bit of adventure. I'm very proud of my country. I'm a patriot of Australia. And so I thought it was just... Uh, a stepping stone from from high school finished high school in 96 95 sorry and joined the army in 96 as a 17 year old i was 17 for six months and then in june i turned 18. so it was a steep learning curve and, straight uh, out of school yeah yeah that would that would have been a, a rude wake-up call <laughs> it was but, but i enjoyed it man it was it was a good adventure what was the premise for doing that was it just that you'd didn't want to sit on your bum doing nothing and you just decided that the uh, army was going to be it or is it running the family? Uh, my, both my granddad served. Yep. Um, they were British army. So granddad McArdle was uh, in North Africa, um, Sicily, Italy, and granddad McNeil was in the air force from memory. Um, and he was a gunner on the anti-aircraft during the blitz, trying to shoot down the, the Nazis. Yep. Um, and then Great Uncle Bernard was a paratrooper, well, led, led to believe, jumped in over on the 6th of June. And yeah, so there, a bit of a bit of military, military history there in our family. Was that, was that a pterodactyl? There was a pterodactyl. <laughs> oh my God. That's embarrassing. Oh, you're right, mate. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> but there is someone to say it is. No. Go away. It's my podcast. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, was it with the reserves or the ready reserves when when it was active uh was it the same sort of boot camp as uh, everybody else went through or was it sort of different because it was reserves because it's exactly the same so the ready reserve scheme um stopped in 1996 when john howard came in but at, at that time you did uh three months basic training it was 13 weeks one week pre-week and then 12 weeks of training and then you did your initial in employment training. So I was um, infantry. So I, I went to, they actually did our IATs in Gallipoli Barracks in Brisbane rather than Singo. And our basic training was done in Pakapunyal um, instead of Kapuka because in 96 Kapuka was being renovated and it was actually overcrowded. So they opened Pakapunyal up for the first time since Vietnam. That's where the Vietnam diggers used to do their basic training, um, which was another cool thing. Um, I think we were the third or fourth platoon through since Vietnam. So that was a oh, wow. big thing for me anyway. Yep. <clears throat> um, and then you did six months in your core. So I went to 49 RQR, Royal, Royal Queensland Regiment. We were allowed to finish our full-time year and then our contracts were stopped by the government. So we were then 
normally would have done four years part time at 49 RQR, um, but we were all dispersed back to our hometown unit. So I went to Mackay, which was 42 RQR from memory, um, and did a couple of years there as a reservist. Yep. And then discharged um, on request. Being ready to reserves, how often do you attend? Is it uh, is it every is, you don't live on barracks? Um, so the way the ready reserve used to work um, is you do your full time year, and then you would do um, a massive exercise at, at Brisbane for an IQR once a year. Um, but once that contract was cut, um, you then go back to your units and you're parading every Tuesday night, and then one weekend every month or so. Okay, Just so normal duress basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So when that finished up, what year, what year was it that fi- that finished up? The 99. 99. So oh, you mean the ready reserve scheme? Or yeah, no, 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 you for for the ready reserves. 99. Yeah. Yeah. So you you're out of there, and where do you move on to next? Well, I studied diploma in information technology, and with a view to get into the information um, technology field, and I did that for a couple of years. Uh, worked for a company called Roshtech up in Townsville, and um, they started to go into not quite liquidation, but not far off it. And mm. they were starting to fire people left, right, and center. Yeah. And they were going downhill very quickly. So I thought, I need to jump ship and fast because I don't want to be without a job. What do I know? I know the military. So I decided to um, just get back into what I know. Yep. But this time I joined the Air Force. In yes. 2001. <laughs> don't hold on against me. <laughs> <laughs> And I wanted to join with as a trade as well. So I know as a grunter, um, you have a certain skill set, but it's not might not be uh, a good skill set to have in civilian life. You you might not pick up that many jobs. I was going to ask the um, the job that you had with the IT stuff was that uh, were you trying to upskill for later on in the military, or was it just something that came through? Just something that came through, man. Yeah. I just thought I'd jump on board and have, have a crack at that. Did you ever think at that stage that you'd join the military again? Oh, it was always something in the back of my mind, man. Even when I was studying, yeah, um, I just missed that military life. A lot of people um, do, yeah. Yeah. And, yes, yeah, so I rejoined. Uh, the Air Force is an aircraft life support fitter. So they work um, with the uh, air crew of, of, of the aircraft. And we work on anything that, that's going to preserve life if there's a crash or they're shot down, um, like life, life, life preserver yokes, um, Sekimar jackets, um, aircrew helmets, that kind of stuff. So it's just schedule servicing. It was a, it was a good job. Yep. But, um, yeah. So how long were you there for? I was in the Air Force for four years, uh, from 2001 to 2005. Um, and when I first joined, I, I made a, basically a promise to myself I wanted to do the job for real, in a real environment. That was always my aim. Um, 2004, we deployed to Qatar, which they call the MEAO, uh, Middle Eastern Aerial Operations. So you're in support of Iraq at that time. I'm only speaking for myself. Um, I'm not speaking for any other Rafis that may have deployed there. I, full respect to you girls and guys. Um, but for me, myself, that wasn't a real environment. It was a bit of a holiday camp. Um, yes, it was um, challenging on a little bit on some days, but for the most part, it was just a great time, you know. For us, anyway, the air, air crew was different. The air crew um, did fly into Iraq, were shot at, almost got shot down, lost uh, one of the contractors. He got shot through the head as they were taking off. So Bloody hell. All dues to them. They... They copped it, but um, we on the ground didn't. And so my family had moved back to Mackay in 2005. So I thought, fuck it, I'll, I'll sh- we had a swear. Fuck yeah. <laughs> sure, thought, fuck it, I'll, I'll try and get to Townsville. Um, and there was one leading aircraft position, RAFI position in the army up there. So I had a crack at that position and was lucky enough to, to gain that position. So I went to 5th Aviation Regiment. I started off in TSS, uh, Technical Support Squadron, yep. uh, as a RAFI. And the MANA, the MANA is basically the uh, RAF equivalent of schema. So they're, they're the ones who control your career, um, choose where you get deployed, where you get posted, 
sorry, where you get posted, not deployed. He said, I can guarantee you 12 months up there and then we'll just fuck you off somewhere else. And I thought, uh, nah, I don't like that idea. So I just transferred to the army as a craftsman in Ramey, which is the Royal Australian Electrical Mechanical Engineers. Yep. Um, and I stayed with them until 2009. And I have to say, this is probably going to step on some toes, but I honestly believe the army do aviation better than the RAF. Oh, wow. They're, they're more disciplined, they're more regimented, um, and I, I reckon they're better at what they do. Sorry if that pisses anyone off, but that's just my view. After having worked with both. It's your own experience, mate, so uh, no one can take that away from you. Yeah, yeah. Um, 2006 deployed to East Timor, um, and that was a little bit more real. Um, not quite there, but but a bit more on point. It was a bit more challenging. We had no running water, so and we had no fresh food for the first month or so, so nothing on the guys who were there in 99. They were on rat packs the entire time. But yeah. We were, only, we were only on rat packs for the first month or so. Um, then we had fresh rations come in. So that was good. Um, it's not quite what I was looking for, though. Right. So what you can you tell us a little bit about your experience with Timor? Because we've had a couple of guys on here from Timor, and I've actually been in quite uh, different roles. And it'd be interesting to get your take on uh, on, on what Timor was like with the, with the environment, with the, the people that you were dealing with and, and all that sort of stuff. So are you able to just walk us through that deployment um, from sort of your, your transport over there, the information that you're sort of getting, your environment when you get there and just sort of walk us through your time through Timor? Yeah, man, no worries. Um, so we were the Black Ops with... Um, B Squadron, 5th Aviation Regiment at the time. So we were, we were working with the Black Hawks. We had four Black Hawks with us. Um, and the first day we flew on to uh, Manura, and that was harboured up outside Townsville and Townsville Port there. We, we slept on the ship that night and then woke up the next morning and the OC thought, what the fuck are we doing? Let's just wait until I start sailing and then we'll land on the ship and go from there. So everyone, go back. You got local leave. Go home. See your families. Cool. No worries. Thanks, sir. Fuck me. <laughs> so off we go. See our families uh, for two days, I think it was, and then we got the recall. Come back to base. Um, got on the choppers. By that point, the ships were just north of Cairns. Uh, sorry, the Manura was, but there's a couple of other ships with her. Um, refueled at Cairns. Got back on the choppers and flew on board. And the Black Handers then folded the rotors back, um, which you can do with the Black Hawks, and parked them up one beside the other um, inside the frigate. Took us four days to get to East Timor. I could not get, wait to get the fuck off that boat. Oh, not, a, not a good sailor. And, and no, I just, just cramped, man. Like we had uh, okay. one, one, two toilets and a shower for 100 people in the, in the mess. They call it a mess, a troops mess. And it just wasn't real, real good, eh? And, yeah, we kept calling the boat because it pissed the, the passengers off. But uh, got off and um, I flew in on one of the Black Hawks, which was really cool, man. You could see where, well, it's not cool for the people of East Timor, I suppose. You could see um, where there was smoke from some of the riots. Yep. The other fellows got on a, a landing craft um, and they landed on the... Um, I think it was the northern side of Dili, and then pack marched in. So we were based at the airfield in Dili. Um, Camoro Airfield, I think, from memory. Uh, and when we landed, there was commandos, and infantry had already secured the airfield. They'd done that days before. When 2006, in May, I think, there were about 10 commandos on the ground and they were fronting up against um, huge gangs of mm. pro-Indonesian pro Timorese. And eventually they said, uh, we need back up now. And that's when the, the Australian government put the ADF back in again for the second time since 99. Yep. Let's see, it wasn't so much the, uh, the weapons and stuff that they were using. It was more the numbers. Um, yeah. You know, they were quite privy... To, to our uh, in rules of engagement and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, um, yeah they just use large numbers, sticks and stones and 
basically they were armed. They did have dart yep. and bows and arrows and yeah. we- weapons with fuses and rudimentary shit. That's, yep. It was the numbers game that, yep. that was the thing, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, were, were you sort of out and about or were you just at the airfield doing repairs or any th- all that sort of stuff? I were at the airfield um, mainly. I got on a couple of flights and went up into the mountains to help offload food to the kids and the families up there, which was freaking awesome, man. Yep. Um, That's, that, that would be very rewarding. It was, and they were so happy to see us, eh? Yeah. Um, I think they felt a bit more secure knowing that it was a military presence there that was on their side. Yeah. Um, and, and willing to protect them if something kicked off. Um, but m- for the most part, I was on at, at the airfield, yep. just doing scheduled maintenance and stuff. Yeah. Awesome, man! So not a bad time in Timor for you, um, no. which is which is good. You leave there when? Uh, August two thousand and six. So I got there in uh, May two thousand six. Left in August two thousand six. Now, were you still in the RAF then, or was this uh, when you transferred over to the military? I, I was in yeah, the, the, the army. army. Yeah, was a cra- craftsman, which is a equivalent to a private P. Okay, so filling in your time, uh, what sort of stuff do you get up to with your um, uh, before you get to uh, Afghanistan? Ah, uh, just back to back to same shit, different day, just normal stuff. Um, and then I got a posting to C Squadron in the Fifth Aviation Regiment, and they're the they call it C Regiment because they're a bit. Um, they seem to be a bit exclusive. I don't know if they still are, but they were at that time. So I got to Sea Squadron, and they're the Chinooks. And that's that was my end game. That's where I wanted to end up. Um, and a great bunch of people, man. I really enjoyed that, that posting. Uh, so we deployed to Afghanistan in uh, 2008, in February of 2008. Um, we landed in Darwin. Some of the SAS boys got on, and then we flew over. And we dropped them off at TK first. And as we were doing a corkscrew landing in, I thought, this is a bit more like it. This is what I'm after. Yep. Um, offloaded those fellas, and then we flew to Kandahar Airfield. And yeah, nice. Out. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about the environment. Um, what, what's your take on the environment over Afghanistan and, and the sort of people that you're dealing with? Did you get to see much of the... Um, the population, or were you sort of behind the scenes a little bit? Most of the time, uh, I was behind the scenes. Um, they had a market that came in once a week, and they were the locals that came in. There's a couple of security threats, allegedly, where some of the marketeers had stolen identification tags from other people, and they thought they might have been Taliban. Um, but they were really nice people, friendly for the most part. Some of them were a bit, um, how's your father? I a bit on edge? It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the only dealings I had. I didn't go outside the wire, and my hat's off to the infantry and SF boys who did, like, fucking hell, they did some hard work out of there. Um, about... Sorry, yes, carry on. So, uh, initially, we were in ATCO um, demountable buildings when we first arrived, and the Taliban had hit us with rockets and mortars, two or three times a week. Um, it was indirect fire and it was delayed delayed trigger. So whenever we got hit, the Yanks would send up Predators, uh, which is an unmanned aircraft, to have a squiz and just see if they could see the firing point and then fire on any enemy they saw. So the Taliban were quick, were quick to pick up on using delayed fuses so that they could set the fuse and then walk away. And then once the detonation happened and the aircraft went up, they were long gone. Um, yeah, so what they'd do is they'd get a PVC pipe, 100 mil or something like that, cut it down the centre lengthwise, and that was basically the rudimentary barrel. So they'd lay the 107 mil rocket into that, um, aim it towards the base where they wanted to hit, get their elevation kind of right, set the fuse, and then use something like a cigarette and lay that. Oh, wow. Fuse. Yeah, so that was a delay time. A rudimentary, but fuck, it works. Gee, that's, in, that's insane, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah. I was actually listening to a podcast where uh, a firefighter was starting fires with cigarettes and matches, 
he had put he taped three matches down the bottom of a cigarette and, went, and, and he'd light it. Obviously, it'd burn down and then light the matches. Yeah, well, yeah. That, that's exactly the same. Like, yeah, that that's incredible. Yeah, it's yeah, effective, eh? yeah, I mean, uh, they might not look smart, but um, they've got some ingenuity up their sleeve, that's for sure. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes it's quite effective. So, it is, yeah. Um, what what sort of goes through your mind when you've got bloody things exploding around you for the first time? Well, the first time, I wasn't scared at all. And that wasn't because I'm some fucking hero. That was because I've never been fired at before, and I didn't know what it was. Yeah. So we were, we were in our donger at the airfield there. Uh, there was the two of us, me and my boss. Um, and I heard what I sound, what I thought sounded like a truck break. You know, right at the end, just before oh, the truck. Oh, like the air brake. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. That's what I heard, and I thought, oh, there's a truck outside. What the fuck do they want? And Paddo, um, who'd been over multiple times to Afghanistan, said, he just looked at me and said, that's a rocket. And I went, what? <laughs> and then we heard the boom. And then the uh, the early warning system. Went oh, off. so the, the hiss, was it taking off? No, it was going over our head. Oy. And they exploded on the airfield. Um, yeah, and then I, I felt fear. And I thought, oh, shit, this is for real. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so we got hit a few times, eh? And there was some close calls. A couple of rotations before mine, one of the um, lasses got fragged from memory. Um, the rocket landed near her hut, and she got some fragmentation to her face. And I think, had she not been bending over to um, tie her shoelaces, she would have died with the frags went wow. over. Most of the frag went over her head. Um, but yeah, there some close calls on our rotation as well. We were setting up a Chinook for a mission, and... Oh, actually, I'll reverse slightly. Um, that that day, the Taliban had attacked Kandahar City, which is about 10 k's from the airbase. They had released about 400 Taliban um, prisoners who said they were going to overrun um, the airfield. They have a, were going to have a crack at it. They knew that if they hit us with rockets, we took cover in bunkers. Right. Um, so their idea was to hit us with rockets relentless, relentlessly and then try and have a crack at the base. So whenever, so, yeah, when you're all hiding away, then they'll just uh, overrun it. Yeah. So uh, that night we were preparing a mission and we got struck a few times. Um, but I think a, a Yankee infantry or SF patrol went out and had a bit of a, a quiet talk to a group of Taliban and killed them. Um, but the others fired rockets in. One of them ricocheted off the concrete just four of our Chinook helicopter, but failed to detonate. Like, fuck. And, um, yeah, we got hit about four or five times that night from memory. But nothing, wow. there was no attack. No, they didn't have the balls to come and have a crack. But um, that was an interesting night. <laughs> <laughs> was that the most interesting night? Uh, I reckon it was, yeah. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Because mm. it, uh, it it pretty it sounds pretty bloody interesting to me. I yeah, couldn't yeah. Have, I couldn't imagine, you know, knowing that there's somebody out there that wants to kill you. Like it, it, it's insane. It just blows my mind that you can sit through that and like comfortably. Like, yeah, their um their mentality is just oh, it's just something else, mate. Eh? They're, it's just pure hatred, I suppose. I yeah, like pure fucking hatred. Yeah. And like I've always been a firm believer that hate is is taught. Like I, I think at, at the core of a human, you're 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 good, you 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 know compassionate, yeah. you know, and all that sort of stuff. And and hate is bred into people. Totally so right, man. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, and I don't know why there's just so much hate over there. I, I don't get it. Uh, if it's all because of one book. No idea, mm. but uh, yeah, just all ideology, hey. And they can knock these fellas over, like they got Al Baghdadi recently, and they got Bin Laden, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, but it's not killing one bloke's not fixing the problem either. I don't know. I honestly don't know what the answer is. You can't cut the head off this snake because no. it, you know it's just you, just because you invented it, it doesn't mean that uh, it's going to stop at you. 
Mm. You know, especially when you've got so many followers that believe the same thing. Like, it, it's just... Uh, I, I can't see this ending anytime soon. Like, I mean, it's it's definitely um, died down, but mm. um, it, 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 it's definitely not going to leave us anytime soon, which is a shame, so... Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think... I think we still have a presence, a small presence in Afghanistan, but not not huge, and I honestly don't believe it's... This is my opinion only. Mm. Uh, I don't believe it's a war that can be won. No, <laughs> no. Because I mean, you're fighting a nation, <laughs> you know, like a, you, you're fighting so many people yeah. that, are, that, that can be, that are being recruited as well, like day after day. They just, they, they just keep recruiting people and recruiting people and, I think as long as people are being born over there, they're not going to have a short of it. So, no, and like I said, it comes down to the ideology. So they teach those kids young. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Wow. So that was good. That was what I was after, man. That was that was the crux of my career. That's, I wanted to do my job for real, and I got to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Freaking cool. So, what the hell do you do in your downtime? Oh, it's it's pretty shellax, man. Eh. Yeah. Um, so they had the um, computer geeks had set up um, satellite connections. So you had internet. Yep. So I had a laptop with me so you could browse the internet, um, send emails home, um, just chillax, watch TV. Oh, that's it good. Was, it was really good, man. Eh? Yeah, cool. But, um, yeah, it was a good deployment. What the hell? Uh, what, they fucked off the Atco huts uh, about halfway through our deployment and they built big concrete bunkers uh, not bunkers but like three story um, accommodation and it was it was rocket proof apparently um, we were never <laughs> I struck. like the quotation marks that you use there <laughs> <laughs> you didn't uh, put your, your faith completely into those things did you? <laughs> I think if a, if a 107 mil rocket struck the building and, and detonated uh, I'm not I don't know I'm not sure if it would be rocket proof but <laughs> But Resist, it was than a, than a, we'll we'll say rocket resistant up to 2,000 yeah, yeah. metres. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. never put to the test, so I think fuck that. Yeah, yeah. What do you do to entertain yourself? Uh, oh, you read, watch TV, um, jump on the net, go for a run, go to the gym. There was a couple of gyms. There was a British gym and there was an American gym. And I, was, <laughs> I swear these fucking cleaners, I swear they did it deliberately, but you get on the treadmill and you go for a run... And they'd come, their idea of cleaning the floor, because it was an open gym, so it was just open to the elements. Yeah. They'd come in and they start sweeping the floor. Fucking dust everywhere. So they thought, oh, here's a water bottle. We'll just pour some water on the floor just to dampen the dust, which didn't work at all. <laughs> and although they kept a straight face, I'm fucking sure they did it deliberately, eh? So you're, you're running. <sighs> <sighs> fucking, <laughs> it's fucking dust and Choking on dust. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why I don't even know why they would fucking sweep it. I mean, it's just gonna. No, oh, I don't know. This, yeah. It sounds was... pointless to me. I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all those sort of different things. Go for a walk around the um, the base as well. You could go for a walk around there. Yep. No, oh, that's yeah. cool. Any what, what kind of fuckery did you get up to? Oh, we didn't get up to too much, eh? Um, was it pretty strict? Was it? It was fairly strict to start with. Like you. After 7 p.m., you had to wear your. If you went outside, if you're in your barrack block, fine, no dramas. If you're outside, you need to wear your helmet, body armor, um, all that kind of stuff. Yep. A lot of us, after the first couple of months, we stopped doing that. You just get blase, man, eh? Right. And it's amazing what the mind can get blase to. So when we rotated out, um, the next rotation came in about a week before we left for handover changeover. Um, and we got hit by a rocket. And we were in the entertainment area just watching TV, watching a movie, hit by a rocket. So we all fol- uh, filed out with our, um, like, singlet thongs bumbling off to our accommodation block to do a roll call. And there's fucking these blokes in their helmets and armour on the ground, leopard crawling around, screaming, um, take cover. Dude, what are you doing? Like, it's, it's, it's all good. Were they new guys? Yeah, they were brand new guys. So... <laughs> Like it, 
if a rocket lands next to you, all, all your body armor is going to do is keep your torso in one piece. You yeah. Can't die, so. Yeah. All right, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you become blase to it, eh? Well, you. I mean, you would. I mean, uh, and that's with everything. You, you get complacent. Complacent is probably a good. Yeah. Good yeah. Word. Yeah. So you leave. You you leave. Afghanistan when? Uh, it would have been June 2008. Yeah, so February to June. Can you remember a time throughout your military service that um, that weighed heavy on you? Uh, I mean emotionally? Emotionally and physically. Uh, it can be either or either. But... Um, it's it seems that you had a, a fairly smooth sort of uh, military career, but was there anything there that really affected you at all? Um, in Afghanistan, we had ramp ceremonies. So, have you heard of those before? Um, no, I haven't, and it would be nice if you could explain that for me and the listeners. So a ramp ceremony is um, when deceased soldiers are sent home. So the C-130 is parked up on their runway, the ramp's down, and they're carrying the coffin or coffins on board. Um, so there were ramp ceremonies in Afghanistan probably once, uh, sometimes twice a week uh, for dead soldiers, and we were encouraged to go down and uh, attend them, which I did as often as I possibly could. Yep. That yeah, that was that was emotional. Um, a lot of them were Canadians. The Canadians got smacked pretty hard. Oh when wow! We were, when we were there, yeah. So not just for Australian troops, it's for for everyone. Everyone, Americans, Canadians. Okay. Yeah. Thankfully, I didn't do any Aussie ones at Kandahar, but there were a couple of Aussies killed um, up in TK when when we were deployed there. That was. Um, upsetting for everyone i think just to know that it was an Aus- oh, absolutely yeah. yeah 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 well i mean and it's not to to uh, to disregard the others it's just oh, that it's a lot lot closer to home for you you didn't know anybody um that had been put on one of those planes did you no not personally yeah no. yeah i can't i can't imagine what it'd be like to attend one of those well multiple um mm-hmm. ceremonies like that um it must beat you down a bit and, and sort of affect your morale as well. Yeah, yeah, it, it did. Um, but it's, yeah, it was emotionally powerful. Um, emotionally draining? Draining. But also, it sort of felt, um, you sort of felt like you'd done something as well in, in turning up and showing your respect. Yeah, absolutely. To that, to that person, to that soldier. Yeah. Because, yeah. Doing your part. Mm. And paying your respects for yeah. for their sacrifice, so that you didn't have to. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, which is which is powerful stuff. I appreciate that. So, uh, when you get out, where are you going? Okay, so discharged on request in February two thousand and nine. Um, I'd done what I wanted to do. I, I did my job for real, and that was my main goal. Um, my wife's family had moved down to Maryborough in Queensland, so we thought we'd shift down there with them. Um, and I had done work experience with the ambulance in year 10 as a kid, and I enjoyed it, so I thought I'll have a crack at that. Excuse me. So I was lucky enough to get in as a paramedic. Um, and in those days, in 2009, you did your training. Uh, it was a diploma, and you did two and a half years on road um, job experience as you were studying. Yep. Um, yeah, and I've been, I'm still a paramedic now. I love the job, uh, and yeah, it's a great job, man. Yep. So how many years is that? It's ten, ten years. Ten yeah. years. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, I actually had to call out time an ambulance. Flies, man. Sorry. Time flies, eh? Jesus. Oh, I said, don't even. <laughs> 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 oh, I sat down on the couch today, and my knees hurt, and I was just like, I was sitting down, and it hurts. <laughs> 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 no, oh, I'm getting old. 
I'll need to be 21 again. <laughs> yeah, that's probably how I ruined my knees. <laughs> fuck, yeah. fuck 21. Fuck you in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had to call an ambulance the other night at work. We had this kid in. Uh, sorry? Cracked a fingernail? No, no. Oh. It's something a little bit worse. But uh, he got a little animated with a Coke machine. Um, something upset him and he, and he decided that he had king hit this fucking Coke machine, oh, busted shit. his knuckles up. And he's like oh. walking around doing the... <sighs> like this, you know. Are you okay, mate? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I said... Yeah, I'm tough. I just said, give a look at your knuckles, dude. And I looked at it, it's all swollen up to shit, bruised. And I was just like, you're right, man. And he goes, I said, do you need assistance? And he goes, yeah, I probably need some assistance. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right. And, right. and my mum. Yeah. <laughs> so I called the ambulance for him. They come and sort him out. Oh, good on you, man. It was yeah. good probably, times. Probably fractured something in there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Look, 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 what happens when you hit something? Like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Coke machine was not phased. <laughs> uh, and the brick wall was not phased. No. Nah. And- Glass window is not fucking phased. Anymore. No, it's, it's ridiculous, <laughs> mate. Yeah, um, it was funny to watch, but um, <laughs> just uh, you know, that, that's what you do when you're a teenager. You just punch it mindlessly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I can't say I haven't done it before. <laughs> I haven't busted myself up as bad as that though. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, when you start your 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 training for your um for your, to, to to be an ambo. Uh, walk us through that. What's the training? Is pretty intense. Uh, it is. I found it. I found it a real challenge, actually, especially coming from a non-medical background. Right. Some of the, some of the people who I was with um, had been or were still nurses. Um, they had good medical knowledge. Medical terminology was down pat before they even started. Mm. And here's me, a baggy ass ex digger, wondering what the fuck have I done. And so, yeah, so what you do is you do six weeks um, down in Brisbane initially, which is very intensive training. Um, and then you start your two and a half years uh, on road diploma, um, which can be challenging at times. Um, but it, I really enjoyed it as well. I had good mentors for the most, for the most part. Yep. And um, exposure to good, good jobs, to all sorts of different jobs, all the way from crack fingernails to splinters, to um, road trauma, significant trauma, cardiac arrests. Um, yeah, yeah. How do you deal with your first major incident? Like, is it just game on, just watching, soaking it all in? Because you've got that disconnect there. You've got, you've got, um, you got something major happening, but you know, right now, I have to learn. What's going on? So you've got a lot of conflicting emotions. How do you nope? nope. How do you, you uh, just into it? Do the job and and just learn as much as you can. Yeah, that that shit comes after. Um, initially, when the job's on, it's game face. You go back to your systems, um, and you work. Is this the same with your training? Like you, you like your first sort of major incident? Like it would it was yep. that way? Yeah. Well, wow. okay. Obviously, it's new. You haven't experienced this sort of stuff before, but you still got your game face on um, and you're disconnected from yourself personally. Yep. And you're just doing your job. Yep. That's how I, I experienced it anyway. Um, and then your reflection comes after that. So um, the first significant job I had was a cardiac arrest of a 42-year-old female, which means where their heart stops. Hmm. Um, so we worked on her for two hours. Uh, but she wow. ended up pass, passing away. I will never forget that's burned into my mind. Um, but not in a bad way, it's just a memory. I don't get, I don't not sleep at night or have uh, bad dreams or anything. It's yep. just something that's there. Um, and yeah, everything else after that just becomes a blur, basically. Can you remember how you dealt with it afterwards? Did they do a, did they do a bit of a debrief with you and and talk about it and explain a lot of things and did they answer a lot of questions that were going through your head, all that sort of stuff? More often than not, if there's time time permitting, um, you'll do, on a big job, you'll do a debrief. So you'll all sit around together. Um, you'll talk about what was done well, um, what wasn't done, what was done but 
could have been done a little bit better. Um, and that, that itself, just talking about the professional part of the job helps emotionally, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, for me anyway. Does it make you understand that these things happen and we don't have any control over it? Sometimes we just we just can't win, you know, mm-hmm. like it, can't win every time. So that's something that you need to be very cognizant of going into this job is um, the fact that every, number one, everyone dies. Yeah. And if someone dies, number one, it's not your fault. Number two, you did every possible thing you could to help them um, and move on, basically. If if you, I think some people some people have personalised that experience, and personalising that experience takes on the family's emotion, the family's grief, and that's a fucking slippery slope, aren't they? Yeah, so, I think. Uh, <sighs> Like I was saying before, I mean, I mean, as human beings, we're supposed to be compassionate, and we, you know, we're we're wired that way. We're wired to be compassionate, and it um, it really blows my mind how we expect people like yourself to to just strip themselves of those emotions um, in order to help us. Like it's just re- it, it blows my mind. It really does. I think the reason we do that is not selfish, it's purely selfish, it's not for compassion, it's not for the other people, it's to protect our own Exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds yeah. a bit harsh, but... Uh, no, 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 but um, we still ask you to do that for your health when we need you the most, you know, like uh, to, to help us out. And um, I just got such high respect for people that do this job because, you know, I... I I don't know how I'd I would react, but I mean, it's all in the training, I suppose. Um, and but every, not everyone gets through, as well. So no, no, not not everyone. You know, is there a certain sort of person that they look for in regards to recruiting? Did you think there's any psychology against it? I don't know. They did a psychometric test. Um, Initially, I don't know who or what they were looking for, um, but I must have slipped through the cracks. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, he doesn't have a heart. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's um, yeah. Well, I mean, you do a, a lot of places do psychometric testing. Police do it. I would say the fire department do it. Um, they're obviously after a certain breed of person that uh, that they're looking for. So to I be able to... I guess they're looking for... I can't speak for them. I wouldn't have a fucking clue. But I imagine that they're looking for someone who has uh, emotional or mental and or mo- mental robustness. Mm. And yeah. And yeah. deal with certain situations and not... Um, provide a service to the community without detriment, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I'd imagine, anyway. Some, someone level-headed. Um, yeah. Cool, man. So, what, with your 10 years, what sticks out the most for you in 10 years of, of being a paramedic? I mean, it's got to be some harrowing stuff out there. Yeah, I've seen a fair bit of shit, eh? Yeah, um, they're a bit of blood and guts. A lot of our work, though, is what we call subacute. So it's coughs, colds, sore holes. That's the mainstay of our work. That's people who sore say holes. this. This is the thing that pisses me off about this job. Is people who spew one time, and instead of waiting, drinking some fluid, fuck, trying some ginger, going to the chemist, trying to help themselves. Mm. Going to a GP for fuck's sake. No, their first point of call is calling the ambulance. And we haul, haul them off to the emergency department. And they're taking a resource away from the community when someone who genuinely needs an ambulance. Yeah. And they may not be getting one because of some numpty who can't look after themselves. That's mm. what pisses me off. That's what, that's one thing after 10 years of ambulance that um, makes me, or grinds my gears a bit. I yeah, I mean, when I was dealing with this this guy uh, on the on the weekend, 
it, it annoyed me that I had to call an ambulance for him for his stupidity. Oh, no, but he's, he probably would have fractured something in his hand as well. That's so. right. And, and it's not that I didn't want to call the ambulance. It's just that this happened. Why do I have to waste these resources on some idiot that can't control yeah. themselves? You know, like, um, I was genuinely, genuinely worried about his welfare. Like, I mean, it was busted up pretty bad. And I'm like, I'm a compassionate person. Like, I asked him, you know, do you need help? Oh, I'll get you help if you need it. Like, yeah, yeah. you're busted up pretty bad. And Was he pissed? No, no, no. He was just, just a kid. Right, right. He was just a kid, like, just venting. Mm. And, um, you Done know. That before. But we can provide him pain relief. And like I said, he's probably yeah. got something fractured in there. That's that's a that's a genuine ambo job, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just just the annoyance of, of having to call him because someone's stupidity is pretty much it. Mm. Yeah. But no, every time, every time I have called the ammo, because I'm a security guard, so oh, yeah. um, every time I have called an ambulance, I've always been so calm, like just amazing people just like, hey, how you going? <laughs> just really laid back <laughs> sounding like, hey, how you going? What's, what's happened? You know, they just get the information and they're just cool as cucumbers, man. And it just, it's really impressive. And I've actually taken the, like, I actually watched them and I take it on board. And, and when this kid busted himself up, I wasn't like, oh, man, look at that. Look you what you've done, it. you dickhead. <laughs> you know, like, no, I was just like, hey, dude, that looks pretty bad. Do you want to want me to call you some help? And, and just just being able to keep that situation, like, nice and calm. And um, because if, I, I, I guarantee you if, if I had to said, if I was a little bit, animated myself about the whole situation he would have been nah nah i'll be right blah, blah, blah. and he never ended up going to the hospital anyway like he they they checked him out in the ambulance and he said no nah, i don't want to go to the hospital so i mean they can't keep him so they yeah, had to let him go uh, and he just got him, on a bus with his mates and and left but um yeah you know it was uh it took a couple of hours out of my time so it made my night go quicker <laughs> but but keeping you cool has such a, a an effect, man. And like you said, he probably would have arced up more if you if you hadn't have kept you cool. Yeah. So, like, if you got a sick kid and you're cool and calm and collected, that helps the child. But really, more importantly, it helps the parents who are there. They calm down. The oh no, he was parents. with mates, like the regular okay. hangouts. Like they 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 just hang around, cause issues. But uh, the, yeah, yeah, it's just trouble kids, troubled kids, and. Um, that in itself, uh, it, it, you know, it gives me the shits, but I understand where they're coming from. They're like, what's their home life like? like I, 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 I keep all that stuff in consideration because you just mm. don't know what these kids are going through, you know? So, yeah, because um, yeah, I'd hate for my kids to be in that situation and no one give a shit, you know? Um, not that they ever would be, but... Yeah, no, and but I've also flowed that on to to people that are angry as well. Like I deal with a lot of people that are aggravated, and um, I just find that keeping calm and I've you know out of all the bullshit that I've had to put up with, I've never been in a physical altercation yet because I've been able to talk my way out of it and reason with them and and all that sort of stuff. So, and I've dealt with some pretty scary people. So yeah, so. Uh, yeah, it's just watching and learning, and and Ambo's got a lot to do with that because you're just so, so calm and and cool. Like I love it. It's great. Yeah. Oh, that's good, man. Yeah. <laughs> so you're teaching me. <laughs> well, grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's been good, man. What kind of um, what kind of support do they do they offer you guys uh, in the event of something? Big. There's two things they got. They got um, peer support, which is they're trained ambulance officers. Um, they have some psychological training, um, and you, when you go to a big job, you're put on a list for the person in your area, and they ring you up and say, you know, are you okay? You need to talk. Um, and then you also have um, trained psychologists available if you need to go and see them. Um, so there's some good support there. Mm. I, 
And as far as the military is concerned, uh, I only just got my white card uh, about a month ago. Took me 10 years to get oh, out of wow. the system. And I thought, fuck, yeah, all right, I'll apply. And um, yeah, but, that, but you get free mental health with that as well, with the white card. Yeah, yep. Mm. Um, through DVA? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, so you reached out to me to give your take on your story. What's the message that you want to get out there? Um, well, the main reason, this is purely selfish, uh, the main reason I reached out to you was to talk about um, some of the books I've written. Okay. Uh, so my main, my main storyline as far as military is concerned was the invasion of Australia by Indonesia. Um, and I wrote that in 2012 when Indonesia was a bit more mainstay than they are now before China came onto the scene. Uh, and it's basically about a group of everyday Australians struggling to survive once Indonesia provides a successful invasion. And I thought the, they couldn't just walk in. Like, I thought, how, how would they do it realistically? They don't have the capability to do it realistically at the moment, but in the fiction world, um, I got them to land aircraft in every major airport in Australia, offload troops and just start blatting the place up. And that sent our anti-terrorist capability into overdrive and all of our attention was inbound in, inside Australia looking at our, all our airports. And then in places like Mackay off... Um, Hay Point, which is a big coal terminal. At any one time, there could be 10, 12 coal ships waiting in line, anchored off line, waiting to cook to, to fill up with coal. So if I had a few of those, who, which look like civilian coal tankers full of Indonesian military hardware, waiting for the airports to be taken and then move in and offload to non-military areas like Mackay and get a footprint inside Australia and then start flying in, that might be a viable way to start an invasion. So that, that's what I did. And um, so the ADF gets smashed as a cohesive fighting force and it's up to everyday Australians. And that's what the storyline's about. Nice. Yeah. The I've enjoyed it, eh? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it keeps me kind of sane. <laughs> <laughs> it gets you, it keeps your brain working. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yep. Then where can people get that? Uh, you get it on Amazon... Uh, or any any bookshop. If, if you want the paperback, you can order it in um, from any of the bookshops. Yep. And I've, I've got a few here. If you know, wanted to contact me through Facebook or my website or whatever. Um, but nowadays, Indonesia is just a backstory, man. Like China has taken over. Mm. So they were scary developing. stuff. Yeah. Have you heard about what they're doing at Vanuatu? No. This is gonna scare the shit out of you. They use a, a, a thing called uh, debt trap diplomacy. So what they do is, this is what they've done in, in Vanuatu. They approach Vanuatu and they say, look, it's an amazing island. I think you could do amazingly with your tourism. How about we build a port for you huh. um, big enough to service any of the cruise liners in the world and you can have all these tourists. Or our military ships. <laughs> well, so the, they've done that and Vanuatu can no longer um, pay the debt back. So China has said, okay, fair enough. How about this? Don't worry about the debt, no, no more to pay, but we lease the port off you for 99 years. What do you reckon? And they, their hands are tied. So that port is now being leased by China and the water off the port's 25 meters deep. So they're leasing it for the cost of what they owe. Yep. Oh, so it's free. Yep. So that port, oh, damn. that port's deep enough to service any of the cruise liners, biggest cruise liners in the world. But conversely, it's also big enough to, to service two carrier strike groups. Bloody if they wanted. hell. And that's on our fucking doorstep. So then they move to um, Tonga and they do a similar thing with Tonga and they do a similar thing to the Solomon Islands. So if you look on a map, um, Australia is here. And if you draw a line between Vanuatu, Tonga, and Solomon Islands, it forms a line like that. Oy. 
So they're basically cutting us off from America, which is up here to our northeast. So they've cut our supply line off to our greatest military ally. Um, and they've done the same thing in the port much close to Australia. Have you heard about that? No. Have, Do I want to know? <laughs> Have Am I moving which... back to New Zealand? <laughs> <laughs> have, a, have a guess which fucking port, mate. No. Port Darwin. They secured that in nineteen in two thousand and fifteen, um, and it's currently leased by the Chinese for the next ninety four years. So they they have shown no military threat to Australia. So ASIO did a before the sale went ahead, the lease went ahead. ASIO did a threat assessment and said, look. Um, it's, it's owned, the company Landbridge is owned by a fellow called uh, Yi Cheng. They said Yi Cheng has no affiliation with the Chinese Communist Party. Sure. Um, so it's fine. There's no threat to Australia. Whew, that was a close one, Ellis. Thank fuck for that. But if you jump on the internet, anyone, and you look up Landbridge, Yi Cheng, it's not hard to see that one of their main business part of parties is the um, Chinese Petroleum Company. National Petroleum Company or something, and they are affiliated with the Communist Party. So he is affiliated with the Communist Party. You morons! Where the fuck were you looking, Asio? Wasn't Landbridge? Fucking hell! But yeah, so it's it's yeah. a joke. It is. So they they have a foothold straight to Australia, if they so choose. Yeah. Wow. So but yeah, China is no longer a developing country. They have arrived front and center. Problem is, they didn't arrive with a song and a dance or an explosion. They arrived like a, uh, a fucking assassin, mate. Mm. Yeah, wow. Well, that's crazy yeah. stuff, man. Fuck yeah. It's the scary, scary stuff. But the Yanks, the Yanks were smart enough to spot it before we did. And they've got, um, well, <laughs> they've got a fucking uh, marine base uh, off Darwin. Uh, but it's only, it's only, it's Marine Force rotation. Darwin or some shit, but it's, they're only there six months of the year. They're only there in the dry season. So for six months, there's no US element there at all. Um, so we are, having served almost a decade in the Australian military, full time anyway, um, we're very good at what we do. I've trained with and worked alongside other countries, and I can say that Australia is one of the best militaries in the world. It was, I think it was actually said by Sean Barry when he was on um, that we we have a small force but it's a highly trained one that's the thing so yeah we're very very highly trained very highly skilled we're fucking exceptional at what we do yep but we're small yep so, so we would get steamrolled you know especially the size of australia you know we yeah but yeah no so it's, it's scary but yeah and look i mean there's probably going to be people out there that go oh fucking here we go conspiracy shit and i'm just like yeah, you know, when you when you look at it closer, sh shit just doesn't add up, you know, like... But see, the thing is, conspiracy theorists are things, to theory, something that hasn't happened. Yeah, 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 but when people people start laying out facts and stuff like this, um, mm. yeah, people, people tend to go on that conspiracy route and say, oh, yeah, like, really, they're going to take over? I mean, they're just, they're just doing what they do. And people, oh, people are just going to be complacent about it, but um, yeah. they haven't shown any military threat to us. But that's not no. to say they won't ever. Like well, you know, like you look, said, assassins don't let you know they're coming. No, that's right. That's <laughs> right, man. And if if they decided to have a crack, then at least their ducks are in a row. Mm. You know? They're literally in a bloody yeah, row and cutting off your supply chain. Yeah, yeah. You know? I'm not saying they ever would, but yeah, no. it's possible possibility. Yeah, but I mean that that's that's. There's a scary thought, you know, and if it looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, <laughs> you know, so, you know, and I'm probably part of the population that's complacent about that, you know, I don't, I don't read up on all that sort of stuff and I'm glad that someone does because I, I don't, I just don't have the time or, or yeah. the, um, the bandwidth to deal with that sort of stuff. So, Yeah. It's fucking interesting. Like, if you jump on um, Google Earth, have you ever jumped on Google Earth before? Yeah. You see, you've got that rollback feature where you can go back through the years and then see what the satellite imagery looked like. Oh, no, not that not, and, not, not that advanced on it. 
Yeah, yeah, there's a little rollback feature on there. So if you go and have a squeeze at Port Darwin, there's a place called um, Wickham. Right. Just north, northeast of Wickham, there's a little spit of land that goes out um, for Timor Sea, I think it is. Um, and in 2012, that was just scrub, it's just forest. And you roll forward to 2019, and it's a mini um, industrial city with a little jetty coming off it. Yeah, wow. So the Chinese have been, I'm assuming it's funded by the Chinese, but they've been busy. But the, but the Chinese have also got these little islands that they've made plastered around the joint, don't they? Uh, South China Sea, yeah. They've, so it's, they've been contended by it's Malaysia, the Philippines. It's east of Vietnam as well. So they've all got dibs on that area, and China's gone out. So they've sailed out south of from Hong Kong. And there's atolls that are already there, and they've just dumped fucking sand and soil on top of the atolls to build these islands. Further south is a little reef called uh, Mischief Reef or something like that. Um, and that's to our north. It's near Indonesia. And on that reef, they have capability to land um, fighter bombers. They have artillery. Um, so it's essentially a stepping off point. Yeah, wow. If, if they needed to. Yeah. yeah. Now that is scary stuff, isn't it? It's fucking interesting, eh? And it, it is very interesting. It's yeah. In, yeah, it's fascinating. It really is. Uh, and like I said, there's going to be people out there who are like, yeah, whatever. But it, it, this, this stuff generally uh, really excites me. Like, um, but I just don't read into it. Like, I don't know why. I, I guess. I got I, I did get caught up in a few conspiracy theories, um, and, and like it just I, I think it just took too much of my time, and and yeah. made me an angry person. <laughs> and I was just <laughs> I, I, re, I was literally just fucking just angry at everything, eh? And um, every time I saw something, like I'd be subscribed to all this shit on YouTube, and then everything. It's, uh, anytime something popped up, I'd just be like, Ugh, "Fuck this!" and "Fuck that." <laughs> And, and, fuck was, and fuck you and and all this other stuff and I, and and I call myself out one day and I was just like this shit is making me fucking angry as shit <laughs> so I just went delete 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 it's like fuck it I can't I can't deal with this sort of shit anymore I'm 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 just too negative like and that's just not me like yeah, yeah it was just fucking me up so I I just tend to do my own thing and not worry about anything yet so I you know like that's it's not crazy so yeah well, i just find it interesting I, oh, it I, is fascinating fascinates I, the shit out of me i just get angry <laughs> yeah, yeah. total respect to china though like they're doing an amazing oh, job yeah of their own national interests um mm. unfortunately we're helping them that's the only problem um yeah unfortunately yeah, we're helping the assassins <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. we're, we're giving them our location you know gps location yeah, yeah. Go, Scomo. You're doing a good job there, mate. Oh, <laughs> I shouldn't get into politics. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Politics was another thing. Like, it just fucking made me so angry. Because none of the cunts yeah. are doing anything for us. Like, they only, they only line their pockets and they go, oh, fuck. Oh, oh, my fuck term's you, up. Oh. Oh, oh, well. Oh, shit. Oh, I got kicked out. Oh, just stabbed me in the back. Yeah. I'll still get me fucking pension. Go get fucked. You know? Exactly right, Jesus man. Christ. It's, it's, it's almost like they were just trying to pump each other through just so they could get their pensions and set themselves up. Like, they probably they probably go and drink at the same fucking pub on the weekend, mm. you know, and, and socialise and be like, hey, this is what we should do, right? You get in as Prime Minister, I'll come and fucking stab you in the back, right? You get your pension, you fuck off, and then I get mine, and then we'll do the same, you know? And it's just like, how many fucking politicians yep. did we go through in, in a matter of four years? Like, fucking six or some shit? Oh, oh it's joking. bullshit. Absolute bullshit. So I've got no respect for fucking politicians. They're, they're lower than the dirt on my boots. And it's just fucking... that some, of them, some of them have like their, their companies off to the side that they use for subcontracts. I will use these this company to build this road and uh, no one needs to know that I own it. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, fuck. Anyway, fuck them. Yeah, fuck <laughs> Look what you've done. <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's all good. So, um, how many more books have you got? Have you, are you writing another one, or? 
Yeah, so there's three books in, I call it the Unforeseen series, which is Indonesia's invasion. I probably should change it to China, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so there's three books in, in that series. I've got a standalone called Tour de Midgard, which is about um, an Australian Special Air Service patrol in Iraq who accidentally set off a time portal and end up in 10th century Denmark. Ooh, a bit of sci-fi. Yeah, so they're working with the, the Vikings and they're, they're trying to get back to ah. their home life and their families and stuff. And they run out of ammo and they learn how to fight with sword and shields. Some of them not very well. And oh, that's um, pretty, that's cool. It's just a romp, is there? It's okay. like it's like getting these these highly trained military guys to go back to sticks and stones. It's yeah, uh, yeah. yeah like yeah, that's pretty cool. I like I that. Lot, I had a shitload of fun with that one. Um, and a couple of short stories in there. And then I started a new fantasy series um, called the Einstein Saga, and it's about an assassin, but he's not Chinese. Um, <laughs> and he dies inside the first fucking chapter and so what I do is I, to save his life one of his friends his main friends gets a witch basically to imbue a nature spirit onto his spirit and force him back into his body so he comes back to life but he's sort of a zombie kind of John Snow <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Problem is that the nature spirit hates all humans, and he has one mission: that's to kill everyone. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh, just one small flaw. Did you read the Did you read the fine print? <laughs> oh no, I fucking can't read. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, that's been fun as well. So that I've got two books in that series, and the third one's coming out uh, next year, probably May June next year. Yep. Where do you find the time to write? Oh. I just I write about 500 words each of my days off, and I, I try and make sure 500 to a thousand. I make sure I do that each of my days off, um, whether I want to or not. I just force myself to do it, and the it must are, keep you up at night. Some chronic like just shit um, running through your head, and what can the, what can I do well, for this? And yeah. yeah, yeah. But fuck it, it's yeah. Like I said, it keeps me semi sane, so that's yeah. the main thing. It's a good way to express yourself. I I express myself through singing, so oh, I, I got yeah I got a karaoke and, and belt out a tune or two and give us a song. Yeah 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 I love it. So no, give us a song now. Sorry. Give us a song. Oh no! Don't even, no, <laughs> no don't even. You, yeah, actually go onto my YouTube. I'm, I, I sing. Uh, what was it? End of Sandman. There you go. Oh, there's oh, there's, there's one on that. yeah there's one on my uh, on my YouTube channel. All right, mate. Yeah, so go go and have a look at that. Um, I actually I was at a party one night, and the guy's daughter had some friends over, and she was talking about um, music and heavy metal and all this other stuff. And I said, oh, I went to the um, Metallica concert, and she's like, oh wow, yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah oh, I recorded it live. And I said, listen to this. So I, I stuck it on. <laughs> And it was the clip on my YouTube channel. And, and she, I said, what do you think of that? And I said, they're really good live, eh? And she's like, yeah, that's really cool. I went, no, no, it's me. And she's like, oh, fuck <laughs> off. So I'm, she thought it was all right. <laughs> yeah, good on you, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, good stuff. Fuck yeah, good on you, man. That's cool. Yeah, I love it, man. And I, we, we all have to um, to vent sometimes and... And usually singing something that you can yell into a microphone at people is, is a good start. So without without getting in trouble. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, it depends how good you sing it, I suppose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, actually, I went out on um, last Thursday night and there, for Halloween, and um, there was a guy there dressed as a Viking, and, oh, cool. and he was singing Slipknot and shit, and it was like, <laughs> and he wasn't too bad at it too. He was pretty good. So I was stoked with that. Oh, yeah, man. Cool. Mate, that's thank fun. you. That's Sorry? That's a silent song. Well, oh, disturbed, disturbed mate. Cool. I tried that one night and I fucking butchered it. <laughs> yeah. It is such a hard song to sing. Oh, mate, it's, he's... Um, and he actually cold. said, I saw an interview with him and, and he said that it was one of the most challenging songs he's ever sung. Mm. Um, so, and it, I think it actually brought the band back together because... I think they used to record apart from each other and, and just send in oh. the music and then they would just have a sound guy put it all together. But he said, uh, I think that the, they actually, it was the first time in years that they all got back in the studio together and, 
and recorded it. Um, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what he said in, in, in one of his interviews. But he yeah, said right. um, vocally it was one of the most challenging songs he's ever sung. So And he did a fantastic job. He did, yeah, he did a magnificent song, job. So he's got another one. Um, well, no, that was Five Finger Death Punch that did um, that uh, Offspring song. Um, oh, oh, okay. They've done some fucking good songs too, eh? Oh, Five Finger Death Punch are my favourite. Um, I love how patriotic they are. Yeah. Um, song Heaven's a good one. Yeah, yep, that's a fantastic song. Battleborn, that's another good one. Mm. Uh, I, I just really love, I love heavy metal songs that you can actually understand. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's not yeah, the I, like I'm a totally big fan of Slipknot, but um, Five Finger just just blow them out of the water in my opinion. So I used to listen to Cowboys from Hell when I was younger, and um, I yeah, to I never really yeah. got into Pantera. Uh, I think Sometimes. it was just too. I just two know. out there. Yeah. Um, They're a bit shouty for me now. Yeah. I'm old, old-fashioned. <laughs> uh, don't tell me about being old. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> My knees are fucking shot. My back's shot. <laughs> oh, it's just horrible. Just get me a new body. Oh. Yeah. But my beard's not grey yet, so that's that's a bonus. <laughs> fucking awesome beard there, man. You could be a Viking. Yeah, man. Well, I actually trimmed it today. Like, I went and got him. I got a haircut just for you, man. And oh, um, <laughs> and I got home, <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck, this thing is wispy as shit." Like it was out to here, and and it was probably I've, I've cut a good two inches off it actually, and uh, because it was Why? just really thin ah. down the bottom, and I was wearing my singlet, and I went just where that singlet line goes. That's where it starts to get wispy. So I was just got the the clippers and just went. Around my my neckline of a singlet, and it worked out well. Yeah, so it looks a lot fuller now, so which is really good. Fucking better than my beard, mate. Mine, uh, mine's like a five o'clock shadow. <laughs> you'll hit puberty one day, mate. You'll be all right. Yeah. My balls haven't dropped yet, so I'll let you know when they do. <laughs> keep, you keep some stuff to yourself. <laughs> no, no, you need to know too, mate. <laughs> oh, mate, this, this has been really good. Um, Thanks for having me on, mate. mate. Oh no, thank thanks for contacting me, man. I, I love talking about this stuff, and um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily matter um, what sort of time you had. It's it's your experience, and I'm glad you wanted to share that. And um, he, you know, even promoting your books and whatnot that that's great because you know why not? Um, it's something that you've found solace in doing, and. It keep like you said, it keeps you sane. It helps keep you sane, and that and that's. Is, do you think that's one of your coping mechanisms? Probably is, eh? Like subconsciously, I, I'm not aware of it, but it, it yeah, more than likely is, eh? Well, it's therapeutic to you, so. Um, you know, I mean, Bram Connolly, he's a he's an author as well, so I don't know if it's the same for him. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so Shauno, by the way, I forgot to mention that. Oh, Sean Barry. <laughs> He's the top dude, man. I yeah, fucking, fucking love that guy. <laughs> he walked into my house and gave me a hug. <laughs> He's just, I was going to shake his hand and he goes, no, 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 give me a hug. And I was like, fuck yeah, all right, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> oh, he was such, he was just smiles the whole way through, man. It was fucking great. No. My, my first time I met him, um, I put my hand up to go and help fill sandbags on... Um, oh, Christ. right, yeah, yeah. And the first, I didn't know where the fucking set was. So I'm parked by the side of the road on the phone to him. And he goes, yep, I'm just coming around the corner. And the first fucking meeting with him, he had his hand out the window. And he's going, and he's, <laughs> and he's fucking, I'm his black hummer. And he, he got, drives into the fucking set. I just followed him in. <laughs> Top life, man. Oh, my, yeah, I, you're great, man. Yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> fucking hell. Um, um, I've, got to, I've got to get... Big Mike on here. Yeah. 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 Fucking the maladjusted monkeys, they they beat me to it, the little bastards. I I'm watching you guys. I'm watching you. But <laughs> I don't know if you listened to their episode, but uh, it was a really good episode. I love uh, with yeah, with yeah, yeah. Mm. So um have you listened to their podcast yet? Not yet, no. Yeah, look it up, no, maladjusted monkeys. Is. Yeah. Um I had those lads on. Uh, a little while back, so, and and they're good guys, so, um, I wasn't I wasn't too upset that they got to him first. <laughs> Man, I love the fact that Mike's 
upgraded an app that's working. Mate, so, yeah, same. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, people might... There's a there's few people shit on it. You know, like, you're always going to have that those people. You know, there's... Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that could be it. I mean, there were... There were some issues with um, some people not knowing how secure it was because it gives out semi-location, like your postcode or whatever or uh, anything like that. But anyone that's using a smartphone, mate, can be tracked anywhere, let's face it. So, um, But that, that's something that we'll, we'll go through when I, when I get him on. So, But um, really, really highly recommend going over to the Maladjusted Monkeys listening to, uh, to their episode with Mike because it was absolutely fantastic so um yeah, yeah well, I got the squeeze. yeah no 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 really good guys yeah yeah tommy and tommy and shane characters <laughs> yeah really good like he's doing like he's doing more than the fucking government is like there was, yeah yeah and it, it, the fact that it's self-funded like yeah. it's just incredible blows my mind that um that the passion you know I wish I had that kind of passion for this, but because um, he, he's working full time, you know, and he's just putting everything he's got into this thing, eh? And I'm just like, it it's, must be so exhausting. And like, he, we went over to Bali, and I remember seeing something like, something like, why is he holidaying? Like, is he holidaying on people's money? And no. No, he's not. He's he needs one. He needs a fucking break. Mm. This guy just needs to be with his family for a little bit. Like he needs time off, and and two, it's not your money. Like he's not making like money out of this hand over fist, you know. So yeah, no, he's yeah. a top bloke, man, and he's doing fantastic work. Yeah, yeah, but but. You know, you're doing your thing too, man. Like, don't don't sell yourself short and don't put yourself down. Like, you're doing um, your podcast. Hmm. You're getting out there. You're doing what you love to do as well. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, I want to get back into my review videos because I don't know what it is, but in the last probably month and a half, two months, my YouTube's been getting hit quite a bit. Like, people commenting on old posts and or old videos and... And all that sort of stuff, and mainly the Rush 12 backpack review that I did. Um, that's getting a lot of hits. I think that's my most popular video at the moment, actually. Oh, cool. But um, it, it's actually really fun doing those sort of things, but I just struggle to find the time. So, um, yeah, I've, I've just got to work out a system, I reckon. And uh, I've got my whiteboard, so I might I might lay something out and, yeah. and, and, and see... Uh, See how it works. I think everything with everything you need a system just to remain focused and on track, eh? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm fucking useless at it. I really am. I'm so fucking stupid. I am too. Ugh, <laughs> fuck. It's just like I, the amount of times that I walk out the door to go to work, and then I pull back in the driveway because I've forgotten something. It's like, a, it's like a fucking daily occurrence, and I'm like. <laughs> I'll see it sitting there. I'm like, okay, I'll just go and brush my teeth before I leave, and then uh, I'll pick that up on the way out. Go brush my teeth, and then fucking walk out the door without it. Like it's just <laughs> stupid shit, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, we're all, I think we're all the same, aren't eh? Yeah, uh, to an extent. Point, yeah, but um, I don't know. I'm fucking useless. <laughs> <laughs> Stop that. No, you're not. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Fucking. Thank you very much for for contacting me and um, and sharing with us, man. I th thanks for having me. It got, it's, it's got me back in the mood to do oh, awesome. to to go out and uh, Sing some and start canvassing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll that's it. That, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. Yeah, go and have a gander. It's a bit, a bit of a laugh. So yeah, it's I'll nowhere near perfect. Time. They're getting a bit fucking old in the tooth now, though, eh? Have you seen some recent photos of him? Well, he actually cancelled his last Australian tour because he's in rehab. Yeah. You know, which is a shame. Yeah. But, I mean, apparently he's always dealt with, uh, you know, suffered from addiction, so... And, unfortunately, it's just affected the Australian tour, so... Um, 
everyone got a refund. I don't know if everyone's got their money because I saw some posts the other day asking if everyone had got their refund because someone didn't, but um, I'm sure it'll filter through. Yeah. You know, but... Well, that, um, uh, it probably has nothing to do with Metallica, though. It's probably the... Yeah, it's probably Ticket Tech or whoever's booking it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's tough, so, but yeah, uh, they're, they're getting on. Yeah, man, the fucking... I mean, well, you look at ACDC. Um, is is Brian Johnson back? I'm not sure. I know old mate died, didn't he? The, um, who was the lead singer? Young... I'm not a massive fan of ACDC, sorry. Oh, really? Well, yeah. this interview's fucking done. <laughs> 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 no. Um, Angus Young. Now, he's a lead, lead, lead guitarist. No, he's still going. No, his um, brother died. Didn't he? His brother. Like, was his brother was, the drummer? Who was the lead singer? The lead singer was Bon Scott. He died That's years and years and years ago. Yeah. And then Brian Johnson come in. And, uh, he's, and then Brian Johnson had hearing issues, so he couldn't sing. So they got Axl Rose to do a tour with them. And apparently he did really well. Yeah. Um, I saw a couple of clips and I thought he was actually pretty good. Um, uh, as a yeah. fill-in, yeah. yeah. So, which, yeah, that's pretty fucking cool. I mean, Axel Rose oh, and yeah. ACDC, <laughs> even even if for a little while, <laughs> that's pretty fucking that's, cool. <laughs> that's <laughs> like I, I never thought thought that Metallica would go with the. Um, you, you ever listen to S and M? Yes, I fucking love that album. I, I didn't think it'd work, and it fucking works so well. Oh, best, mm. best album ever, you know. I wasn't I wasn't a big fan of um, of things like uh, Master of Puppets and all the real heavy heavy fast stuff. I was more of a load reload sort of yeah. person, yep. and uh, the Garage Inc was good, but S and M Mint. That's the best yeah. album they ever did. It's fucking good. Yeah. I should revisit that that idea, eh? And yeah. How good? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be mad. I reckon other bands should do that as well. well I wonder how Five Finger would go with a with an orchestra. <laughs> probably really well, mate. Oh, I reckon they'd fuck. They'd make it work. Even Disturbed, yeah. I reckon, would make it work. Fucking nice. Yeah. Great bands, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> what, are you, as, what, oh, what are your What are your plans for now? Well, what, what are your plans? For, going forth um oh so my plans going forward are um i'm starting next year i'm starting a degree in social work okay fucking nervous man i haven't started at uni before so uh, and it's especially as a 41 year old so i'll give that a crack um and it's part time so it'll take six years but my idea is to try and get into helping veterans out at some point um i don't think it's necessarily necessarily being done particularly well so i want to try and get in somehow i don't even know if i can as a social worker but i want to try um so i'll move sideways out of the ambulance into social work and just see if i can help out the veteran community somehow in that field yep so no, that's bit, awesome nervous and excited but yeah that's what I'm yeah well, i mean you've got that drive there so i don't think well i mean you, what you've been through the military so you've got all that training against you. You've got, well, for you, you've got uh, ambulance training. There's no reason why you couldn't do it. Look, it might come across as a bit daunting, mate, but you've definitely got the goods to do it. I mean, look what you've already achieved. So, so I don't think you're going to have any issues, mate. Yeah, thanks, man. I'll, I'll give it a red hot crack anyway. Yeah, and that's all you can do, man. That's all you can do. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I've got to get this fucking shit sorted out with uh, with with ca canvassing and whatnot and getting getting more people on because I, I really do enjoy doing this and, and talking to people and getting stories out there. Um, I mean, I didn't buy all this fucking equipment for nothing. And no, I, no, I, I, I really do enjoy it. I'll, I'll try and share. Um, I'll definitely share this. And when I see others, I'll share it as well. For what, it, what it's worth, it might not help at all, but... Every, every little bit's worth something, I suppose. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm just really glad that people are starting to reach out and, and ask me about it. I've actually I've, I've got an interview coming up that I'm really excited about. We've just got to line up times. Um, yeah. I'm going to give up my Saturday morning. I'm going to suggest that they come over on, on Saturday morning um, because it's just really hard for these guys to to get through on a weeknight because there's three of them in three different locations. So oh, yeah, so it's a little bit um it's a little bit tough, but I uh should I tell you now a bit of a spoiler? Yeah, yeah bugger it, why not? Some <laughs> of the guys from Brothers United. Oh, fucking awesome. Yeah, man. so um yeah, Thumper's gonna come on with a couple of mates and um and discuss and discuss that. So we just got to line up the times. I'm going to actually contact them after this, and and get into it. So uh, th- that'll be a really good episode, I think. That's awesome, Ellis. Yeah. Well done, man. Another one that I want to get on is Willie. Um, you know, Matt Williams, Willie beating cancer. Oh, uh, sorry, no. I'm no, don't don't that. don't follow that one. Um, yeah, he's um, ex-military. Well, sorry, current military, still in the military, and he's he's got a brain tumor. Oh shit! Yeah, and um, at the moment it's inoperable. So he's he's another one that I want to get on, but he's extremely busy, like uh, like fucking flat out. This guy, he's an absolute legend. So what's his um? Does he have like a Facebook page or something? Um, so it's Willie beating cancer. I'll jump on a follow him, man. I, I hadn't heard that one before, but yeah, no, wow. he's he's fucking awesome. He, I think he's in Adelaide. Don't yeah, quote right me on that. I think he's in, yeah, somewhere down south. Are they using like um, radiotherapy or chemo or anything like he's that? He's done. Or? He's done chemo. Um, I don't know the full story, but um, he, I know he's done chemo and his tumor's not growing, which is a good sign. Yeah. So, um, but the, yeah, it's complicated. I'm probably not qualified enough to say or, or up to date enough to to really say okay. much. But uh, actually, recently Instagram fucked up and deleted his account, oh, um, which has got every like his whole history on there, you know, from when he fucking started, which is devastating um, because there were about four or five different people mimicking him and then they put uh, reports in against him to say that it was fake and they fucking deleted his account. Dumb cunts. So, yeah, mate, he's fucking devoted about that and, and you fucking would be too because it's got his whole fucking journey on there from start to current and uh, that, that happened a couple of weeks ago, I think. I have fucking... to admit, I fucked up last night, eh? Oh, what'd you do? I had a mate who um, I was in Afghanistan with, he was a medic. Yeah. And he forgot his password. <clears throat> so out of the blue, I get this fucking friend request on Facebook from him. I thought, uh, what the fuck? He's already a fucking friend. Is this a hacker nah. account? So I just, I just asked him, where did we serve together? And he replied, um, Suai, East Timor. But it was actually Afghanistan. I thought, ah, he's a hacker. <laughs> Reported. <laughs> it was actually fucking him. You oh, no. No. So I've contacted Facebook and I just said, look, I fucked up. This person's genuine. And, oh, dickhead. So hopefully they reinstate it. But oh, so they actually deleted his account? They haven't deleted it. They've just, they're Put pending it. an investigation. So oh, right. Okay. Dumb bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I won't hear the last of that. <laughs> Who needs enemies, mate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if the worst thing that happens to you is you get your fucking Facebook deleted... That's first world problems right there. Well, that's true. We right. probably will be better off without it, to be honest. <laughs> 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 Fucking social oh. media, holy shit! If you if you if you listen to our uh, episode of Smack uh, Talking Smack, no. Oh fuck! <laughs> that gets pretty <laughs> loose about social media. Yeah, go and have a listen to that one. <laughs> yeah, me and me and a couple of mates, and um, I had three guys over here. Two. Two Kiwi fellas, two two black fellas, and there were two white fellas, and the other white fella, because I'm the other one, and he goes, yeah, and then the other white fella said, uh, 
Well, so we're a half half panel here, so racism is not possible. And I was like, "Fuck, this is not going to go down well." <laughs> and really <laughs> but um, yeah, they, these two uh, fucking give give it as much as they get it. So that uh, was good. <laughs> fucking great episode. Yeah, I'm not surprised I haven't been kicked off the fucking internet yet. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all good, man. Yeah. All right, Social mate. Media is, is a is a fucking. Uh, Who's mate, this? Though. Social media is just a fucking oh mate, it's though. a fucking. There's so yeah. much fuckery on there that oh, and there's you know, so much hurty hurty feelings. Or, yeah, or yeah, there's, there's just too much superficial shit on there as well. Like, I mean, you look at these chicks on Instagram and stuff, and they're just trophies. That they, they, they treat themselves like fucking trophies, and I'm just, I'm, I'm not into it, eh? I'm no. so not into it. You know, you've seen, that, you've seen that meme or mem, whatever you fucking have. Memes. You fucking it. Yeah. And it's um, a chick of a social media chick, and she goes, I'm a model. And he goes, Oh, wow, really? Who do you work for? And she goes, Oh, no, on Instagram. Yeah. And, he goes, and his reply is, <laughs> Oh, I'm a sniper. Yeah, goes, yeah. Oh, really? Are you in the army? And he goes, No, I'm Call of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking true. Oh, oh, fuck keyboard <laughs> warriors. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I saw a video on uh, this dickhead. He's like, uh, I think someone might have been cracking onto his missus. God knows how he fucking got one in the first place. But <laughs> he's like, you know, fucking names. Or he just rattles off all these fucking these um, first person shooter games. And he's like, these are highly simulated uh, games, and have trained me to be able to kill motherfuckers like you. And I'm just like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> At what uh... what stage in your life do you think that's training? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh shit! I bet you, I bet you, his SAS Delta Navy Seal. Like, yeah, like yeah, that. you fucking, you know. And that's on his days off. Fuck. Yeah, <laughs> days <laughs> off. <laughs> He's got every day off. This can't live in his fucking <laughs> mum's basement. <laughs> well, we're, we're paying for it. Fuck. Yeah, yeah eating who, fucking who peanut dummies? butter sandwiches. Fucking hell! Jesus, some retards out there. <laughs> like, like I, I used to do paintball. You know, and I think that prepared me zero for fucking any sort of conflict. <laughs> yeah, shit. <laughs> yeah, some delusional oh, people out there, eh? What a stupid thing to say, yeah. No, uh, right. fucking idiots. I've got, I've got to get cracking, mate, but um, thank you so much for having me on, eh? Mate, it's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Glad to have you on. Um, spread the word if you know anybody else that oh, well, uh, wants oh, to wants to come on. It. I don't know, you might be part of it, but there's a Facebook group called Facebook Military Veteran Entrepreneurs, Business Owners and Entrepreneurs or something. Um, can yeah, can I, you send me a link for that? I will, mate. Yeah. And I can share on there as well, this podcast on there, and then ask if anyone's interested to reach out to you. Absolutely. Okay? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Okay. That'd be fantastic. Right. Sweet as, man. I'm going to get on my whiteboard and start fucking putting down names to contact. Yeah, fucking oath. Yeah, I'm going to do that. So... I need to get this thing cranking. I'll try, I'll try my best to help spread the word, mate. Yeah, man. For sure. For yeah. sure. All right, buddy. All right, mate. Enjoy your Colorado. And, um... Oh, well, man. I oh, fucking I picked it up yesterday. I am absolutely loving it. Fuck yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. So Holden stoked. Bloody good, bloody good car. And that, that's it. Yeah. Car, oh, look, and, like, people are going to shit on it. But people are going to shit on every car, you know. There's I, there's diehards out there, and I'm like, as long as I suppose, as long as you treat it well, it'll treat you well. Yeah, that, that's my that's people, my people, thought. Some people whinge for the sake of fucking whinging. Yeah, like oh, I was brought up, I was brought up on Ford, but realistically, I don't give a fuck as long as it gets me from A to B, A to B, exactly, and right. safe. Like it's a lot yeah. safer than what I had. Fuck that thing yeah. drove like a boat. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was terrible, eh? Oh shit. And the guy, the guy that uh, sold me the car, bought it off me for for a thousand dollars, and I was like, "Holy shit!" I said, "It's got, um, it's got like fucking what seven months rego on it as well." And I'm like, "I was just gonna give it away." I was, I, I was the plan was to start a GoFundMe and get it fixed up and then give it to someone, but you know, I, I, it would have cost more to fix up than what he paid for it. Yeah. You know, so fucking, I can, um, I could use the money as well, to be honest. So, you know, now that I've got a fucking loan for this thing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. All right, mate, I'm going to let you go. 
thank you so much for coming on. Spread the Thanks word. For me on, and um, um, yeah, uh, it's been fantastic. And, yep. I've enjoyed it, man. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's been, awesome. it's been absolutely magic. So, Keith, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thanks, Alice. Appreciate it, mate. Have a good day, eh? You too.